Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Muhammad, uh, for inviting me. Um, my data is uh, not so big, but I think it's unusual and early, and I'm uh, very much in awe of the resources and skill uh, that I've seen over the last two days. I come from a very, I don't come from really the, the kind of uh, statistical and uh, mathematical uh, background uh, that was on show here. Um, so what I'll try to do today is explain the data set I've been using, which is based on actually a literary work composed in the middle of the 13th century uh, uh, for a specific province in, uh, in uh, Egypt. Uh, the project and the outcomes of the project that I've done on it, um, and the main results uh, concerning uh, economic profile, population size, uh, profile of the subsistence versus cash crops, uh, Muslims and Christians, and uh, my thoughts on the process that we see in a particular uh, point in time, and what I think uh, could be done more with this data. First, just to, since we haven't been outside of Europe, I think, uh, over the last two days, really, or at least I, I know there was a Chinese Soviet, I'm sorry. But uh, uh, in Egypt, uh, we're looking at this province uh, called the Fayum, which is uh, west of the Nile. It's a topographic depression. Um, in 300 BC, uh, the large lake that was there was drained by uh, Hellenistic or Greek uh, engineers. Um, and then what the way it works is that uh, it is fed by the Nile uh, and then uh, excess, uh, and then the, it's regulated by a dam uh, in uh, a place called Lahun. Uh, then the water is channeled through canals through to the cultivated areas and then uh, excess water flows to a lake. Uh, it is very fragile and complex irrigation system, more than probably anywhere else uh, in that region. And what happens is that if there are any fluctuations in the maintenance of this irrigation, then uh, villages get deserted very quickly. Uh, and because of the desert around it, then you have uh, many uh, sites and documents that are preserved from that area through, throughout uh, the centuries, especially until the 11th century uh, AD. Oh, oh, now, in fact, the source I'm using is not found in the Fayum itself, despite uh, in, it in addition to, um, to these uh, um, documents. It's a literary work, a manuscript written by a bureaucrat that was sent by the Ayyubid Sultan, so this is the dynasty in Cairo, so he was sent from Cairo to audit the revenues of the Fayyum in, uh, he was sent there in the spring of 1245. What he has done is he's written a report to the Sultan about the province, which includes some introductions, some ideas about how to improve the productivity, but he includes 90% of the actual manuscript is his audit, meaning the report of the tax liabilities for 100 villages, more or less, and plus 30 hamlets for a fiscal year, which is more or less, we, we are not sure exactly if it's exactly 1243 or, or not. So AH is the Hijri uh, era. This treatise was known now for over a century, uh, but nobody thought of actually doing a statistical analysis with it or, or studying it. Uh, well, I think there was also not the capability of doing that. Um, and this is an the, the manuscript that is survived. There's, uh, there was another manuscript from which the Cairo edition was made. There's nothing like it for any other region of the medieval Islamic world in terms of the level of detail. For each of the villages, there is a short description of the size and location of the village, the population of the village in terms of to which 
clan and tribe they belong, whether they're Muslim or Christian, the water sources, the recipients of the village revenue, whether it's a, mil local, whether it's a military officer, the Sultan in Cairo, or a, a religious endowment, and there are more that I'm not including here. The, then the next main uh, category is agricultural revenues in kind, uh, which are mostly in grains, wheat, barley, uh, full, broad beans, and rice. Then uh, agricultural revenues in cash from vineyards, orchards, and, and flax, cotton, garlic. Commercial revenues from shops, potters, and weavers. Local fees in small amounts uh, of silver coins. Pastoral fees by the quality of the meadow per animal. Uh, tax that is an Islamic tax on uh, livestock, fruit, and capital. Poll tax, which is very important for a lot of what they'll say. A poll tax, which is on any non-Muslim men above 13, or at least, uh, uh, and it's a fixed rate. Uh, poultry, every village has a rearing quota. Uh, then there's advanced sales of barley. There's sugar, there's work on plantation, on state on uh, sugar plantation and presses. Uh, seed advances, arrears dating back 13 years. Uh, and more. I want to qualify. So this amount of data, which you know, that tabulated for 200 different categories of data, not all of them for every village. One is there's no census of the population, so we don't know. It doesn't tell us Nabulsi how many people lived in each village. It doesn't. Not generally, there are very few names, and these are tax liabilities, not actual payments. And he uh, did he uh, uh, completed these out of reports made by the local tax officials or by village headmen if there was no uh, local tax tax or village in a small village. So this this is for every one of the 100 and, uh, plus villages that we have in this work. Um, so we started this project uh, in 2009, it was an HRC project, uh, and the results are uh, an academic edition, an English translation of the Arabic work, uh, then a study of uh, uh, what can be learned from that data, uh, and then it's available, the, the fiscal data, or co all the data is available on Excel spreadsheet. I know it sounds ancient for you people, but this is how uh, it's been made. Uh, uh, and then there's a series of GIS maps produced uh, by Mike Sasha from Cambridge, and you will see a few of them now. So this, um, what we have here is a profile of a rural region, a medieval rural region, that I think is uh, unavailable for other uh, areas of the Islamic, of the Middle East, the Islamic world in that period. These aggregates uh, are um, confirmed by the aggregates that uh, Nabulsi himself, the author, makes. So he himself uh, aggregated in the treaties uh, the different amounts. So these are uh, the, the amounts per village are confirmed, validated by him several times. He, he, there are subdivisions. So these are uh, repeated several times and, and quite, uh, are quite certain. As you can see, uh, the main um, the main produce of this rural area was wheat and barley. Um, these are taken. These are. I'm showing here the tax revenues. I'm not showing the actual uh, what was actually produced because we don't usually know the tax rate. But what I'm showing is the tax revenues, as reported by Nabulsi. Um, so wheat, for example, which is the main in this particular province, known in other in literary sources as being uh, as being very productive, uh, the, the the granary of Egypt, you have uh, taxes, liabilities. So uh, supposed to raise seventy thousand ardabs, which are about six and a half million liter 
of wheat. Prices, I calculated them by average prices in Cairo at the time. Um, so by this, uh, we can say that um, these were valued above 50,000 uh, gold coins, the wheat revenues, and they certainly were nearly half of the, of the uh, value of all the taxes of the province. And then barley, uh, the second choice often used also for animals as further, uh, is uh, the second most important uh, um, agricultural produce. What is, I think, impressive here is this, the level of tax, detail of taxation. So you have land tax on orchards and plantations. Then you have separately tax on fruits. You have a, a different set of land tax on field crops than, other than, than orchards and plantations. Arms tax on livestock, and you see uh, the, um, the taxes on, on livestock are very low in terms of the aggregate, but this is, as I, I will mention, in, these are because livestock is probably was taxed in a much lower rate than, uh, than uh, wheat, much harder to tax as well. Taxes on commerce, fishing, arms tax on capital, including taxes on slave, which are very few. And then a uh, poll tax on non-Muslims, which account to about 2% of the total. So with, I, would, I estimate at around 100,000 gold coins, these numbers are taken from the Gulsi, this is estimate. Now, in terms of the population, as I said, I, a lot of people here talked about population. Um, we don't have a census here. So how many people were talking about in this rural province? One way is to go from the poll tax on Christians, because these are numbered, because they each of them pays a fixed poll tax. There are two villages that are said to be completely Christian. There are two small villages, uh, and they uh, include, uh, they were of a population of 150 men. As I said, only adult, adult men were uh, subject to poll tax. So, um, and they pay out, and they pay a, a small amount, 0.375, of total contribution to the levy of irrigation in the province. From that, one could get a very high number of 40,000 men and 130,000 people by a multiplier of 3.1 to uh, one adult man. Uh, that seems very high, and of course, the observation of two villages is very limited. Um, going from the size of the cultivated area based on the location of the villages mentioned in Nabulsi, and most of them can be uh, reconstructed, uh, we can get uh, estimates by the density of population to a lower number of 60 to 90,000. And then if we look at the wheat production, uh, we, or at least the, the, tax, the tax on wheat, we see that uh, the tax on wheat is uh, 75,000 uh, Arabs, so as I said, six and a half million uh, liters. We, I estimate the tax rate based on literary sources, not mentioned here, uh, at 30% on grains, leaving at 70% or 175,000 Arabs with the cultivators, um, given that we know from sources at the time and from um, medical literature that a uh, person needs on two Arabs per person per annum, one would expect here that um, no more than 90,000. So we're talking about a population of somewhere between 60 and 90,000 or 70, 90,000 people. So this is a beginning of the economic, uh, economic or, uh, analysis of the, uh, uh, of the profile of the agricultural production in the Fayum at the time. This map made by Max Rachel shows uh, grain production uh, in different villages. So each village is given a, a, a location, uh, and then uh, the, this is the amount of grains relative to the total of the Fayum. First, you can see here, as one expects, but it's important to emphasize that nearly all villages produce some grains. 
uh, only villages here that have very minimal grain production because their fields were uh, uh, devoted to flax production. So in the middle of the depression, in the main depression, every village uh, uh, produced grain and it seems uh, that this is correlates with, uh, with, other, with almost any other indicator of the village size. You can see also that villages at the edges of the province, like this one or this one, produced barley instead of, of wheat. And this is certainly because of so shortage of water at the edges of the province closer to the desert. So wheat was produced when you have uh, enough water to produce, uh, to produce it if the second choice is barley. The taxes on cattle, and we're talking here small cattle, sheep, goats, and camels, very detailed. First, what you can see here is that, again, in most villages, you have production of, of uh, small cattle. Then, um, what it means, it is important to emphasize, is we have here confirmation of mixed economy. So the same villages who produce grain, also people in the village own a, a sheep and goats. This is not surprising, but important in terms of thinking when you have reports of herds of sheep, these are part of the economy of villages. These are not part of a, a nomad economy or pastoralist economy. You can see here that there is a difference. Some areas are more represented, of course, in the production of small cattle. These areas are around, sorry, these areas are around the town in the middle of uh, the province Medina Tel Fayum. So what we have here, we can see here clearly production of sheep, specifically sheep, for the urban center, uh, uh, while probably in the other regions of the province, there was less consumption of, of sheep for, uh, for meat, of lamb. But you have here, it's probably concentration for uh, provisions for the city. Nabulsi himself says that the, the lamb he tasted in the Fayum was awful and it was like mastic in his mouth. But the point is that uh, he still had meat in the city. Camels, which are also taxed, you see them mainly on the edges of the province. Camels are used for transport, and this is not something that is uh, specialized for most recently. If we move now to um, we move now to the pasturing uh, fields. So here, what we can see is a difference, some difference between the number of sheep and goats owned in each village and the taxes on pasture for each village. So this can tell us, for example, that there were, that the pasture for, for local herds was not in the village where they were owned necessarily. We can also see from the way these are distributed that some some pastures were permanent. This is show here. So some pastures were permanent. These are in central regions, which are well irrigated. While on the edges of the lake, where there's quite fluctuation in, in season between uh, inundated areas and uh, that there are seasonal inundation, uh, you can see that there's more in this area and probably herd or flocks of sheep were, uh, were uh, suddenly herded in this region and moved from uh, other places in the province. So this is give you a sense of what I think we are, can do with this data in terms of understanding the seasonal and composition of the subsistence economy uh, in, in, this, uh, in this region. So all of this, I think, is not for sale in Cairo, there's no evidence that anything like that is exported 
outside of Cairo, uh, apart from the taxes themselves, uh, all the uh, what's left in the hands of the cultivators is uh, is only uh, for subsistence. The most complex, the most lucrative economic uh, economic aspect was uh, the sugar cane production, where you have sugar presses which require power to be powered by oxen or by water. Each of them is assigned an, a specified number of, uh, of feathers or plots of land uh, to be worked by uh, la la wage laborers or some other uh, form of, of, uh, of compensation, financial compensation, uh, uh, and each assigned to a specific uh, press. One can reconstruct how many, uh, uh, how much land was could be, uh, how much land for of sugar could be uh, used by each uh, press, for example. In terms of the population, perhaps the most surprising aspect of what uh, Nabuzi tells about the population is that each of the grain producing villages was identified with a tribal group. And these are tribal groups uh, are given names that suggest they claimed an Ar Arabian genealogy. So these are tribal groups that come with, uh, with a set of, with a lineage that goes back uh, in principle to the Arabian Peninsula. You can see clearly, so, that so Banu is a clan. So if you look at all, at, uh, for example, th these uh, Banu Zara, they are found in this area, and they belong to the Banu Ajlan, which is the confederacy of all the clans that belong to that. These are clearly territorial confederacies. Moreover. You can see, as here, that they often go along the irrigation canals. They're not just territorial, but appear to show, not always, but generally appear to follow a, a, a canal, meaning that there's some kind of a coordination of upstream and downstream communities. So we have three major confederacies, and clearly, they are territorial uh, with clans uh, inhabiting uh, each of the grain producing villages. These tribal groups are also levied for uh, soldiers or riders for royal campaigns, whether they are actually delivered or, or monetary uh, equivalence was given. It's less important. What the important here is that they are assumed to be armed. They are assumed to be armed. So each confederacy is giving a certain number of riders for royal campaigns. On the other hand, are the Christian communities. The Christian communities in this report are assumed to be non-tribal. The two fully Christian villages have no tribal indication. And Christian communities are found in the town, the largest Christian community in the town, in the two market villages, the largest villages, and on other villages that are associated with orchards and sugar presses, and one even with a weaving center. And this is correlated with the number of churches that are found. It makes sense. This is generally the churches are, uh, you know, the functioning churches are related to the number of Christian men uh, subject to the poll tax. If we look the number at the map of churches and monasteries, so these are 
found in places where the, these two villages, for example, are sugar presses. And or in this village is the major orchard center. We have in the city, in the town. Monasteries, on the other hand, are spread. Monasteries are remnants of the Christian pans, past, the Christian past of the province. So, of course, in the seventh century, when uh, when uh, Muslims conquered Egypt, the Fayum was entirely, as far as we know, was entirely Christian. So, what can we do with this data? We can see that Christian Copt. I, I can show. I think I went quickly there. The number, total number of Copts, uh, actually Christians, uh, Christians and other non-Muslims. That these are certainly all, uh, nearly all uh, Christians, was just above one thousand, and we said that the total population was around seventy thousand. So we're looking at a Christian population of around 5%, it's hard to know exactly, but definitely a small minority. But since the Fayum gives us so much uh, earlier information, then we can see uh, that in fact, uh, until the end of the 11th century, there were many Christians in the Fayum. When we come to documents that were uh, excavated in deserted villages, we see that uh, many of them uh, had a substantial Christian population. Again, in 1245, in the year of this the cadastre, nearly all Muslim villages had tribal identity. They were collectively taxed for grains. We don't have, uh, as far as we can see, there was no, uh, it doesn't tell us that individuals were taxed for, for grains. Christian villages and communities were associated with orchards, plantations, and textile production. And this is exactly what uh, Muhammad actually showed in his paper, this, this idea of how a fixed poll tax leads to the conversion to Islam of the poor among, among the non-Muslim population, leaving only the wealthier uh, non-Muslims in their uh, original religion. So you can say one possibility to explain this data is to say Arab tribes came from the Arabian Peninsula with the Arabian lineage and replaced the original non-Muslim population. But this is unlikely, plausible in terms of demography and even the place name, there is complete continuity. The more likely uh, possibility, which actually emerges also from uh, Muhammad's uh, paper, is that the local peasant population converts to Islam, but then how come they're all tribal and claim genealogy from the Arabian Peninsula? Well, they invent it. So a lot of papers in the last two days talked about people used a genealogical website and people reporting their genealogy. Um, just a warning from the 13th century. I think that the people of the Fayyum in the 13th century were lying through their teeth about uh, about their genealogy. They were inventing uh, their lineage in order to find themselves a place in the Muslim community to which now they, uh, um, they belong. Um, and claiming this tribal identity uh, was uh, the ultimate act of conversion. It's completely hiding the fact that you are convert. Um, so, uh, based on this, what I'm arguing is that uh, tribal affiliation, uh, and this I think you can see from the data, uh, belonging to a tribe had function because this was collective uh, taxation. With, with, I wasn't, I, I didn't explain the land uh, uh, regime, but the land did not belong to the villagers. The villagers are tenants and they annually received collective tenancy rights. So what we, what I read as land tax so far are really the, the lease 
uh, it, properly speaking, in, 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 in the legal sense. And so what I think is that the membership in these clans uh, was the way to regulate access to, to the, these lands that were given to the sheikh or the, the heads of the village. I showed you this map of the tribal uh, distribution, how I think that the tribal sections or clan provided uh, so uh, provided a control over water sources. You had upstream and downstream communities, inevitable tensions and memberships in clans that were related to each other. So several villages that belonged to the same clan was a way of politically uh, 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 controlling these, uh, these conflicts. Uh, they were armed, they provided security, and this was a method also for resisting taxation and state authority, and we have reports of revolts by our tribes, not in this uh, source specifically. So to conclude, what can I actually offer at this forum? First of all, I want to highlight that this is a, a unique a medieval resource that is uh, both unique in that it comes from a relatively early area uh, and from uh, outside Europe, um, and that is available to people who uh, that it's available uh, online. Uh, that it allows, I believe, uh, a more refined understanding of uh, policies of at the village level of what to produce, how uh, what would produce the link between uh, cash crops. Uh, livestock and grains in a way that is generally unavailable for us in for other context, not only in the Middle East, I think. I'm suggesting that the idea of different populations and tribal identities needs to be uh, thought more creatively, as I'm saying, I think tribes, for example, identities Tribal identities can be um, forged, adopted, invented much more than we uh, allow for generally. Uh, the main uh, hope uh, I have for today, in many ways, is that uh, people here who have so much, so many skills, uh, will be able to look at this data from other perspectives and mainly offer. Uh, econometric analysis, if that's the right word, of the uh, of the fiscal data uh, to reconstruct aspects of the of the agricultural production, uh, and also what needs to be done is to make a final correlation with the actual topography of the Fayum today, and to collaborate with archaeologists to see how much uh, we can link, um, for example, water resources. Uh, to the way uh, the economy developed. Uh, thank you very much.